the tree of life. The Kabbalah is an archaic system of Jewish mysticism. For us moderns, the Jewishness may readily be omitted, and most of its mysticism may also be left out, leaving only a simple philosophical or mathematical structure called the Tree of Life. Said Eliphaz Levy almost a century ago, on penetrating into the sanctuary of the Kabbalah, one is seized with admiration at the sight of a doctrine so simple and at the same time so absolute. The necessary union of ideas and signs, the consecration of the most fundamental realities by primitive characters, the trinity of words, letters and numbers. A philosophy simple as the alphabet, profound and infinite as the Logos. Theorems more luminous and complete than those of Pythagoras. A theology which may be epitomized by counting on the fingers. An infinity which can be held in the hollow of an infant's hand. Ten numerals and twenty-two letters, a triangle, a square, and a circle. Such are the elements of the Kabbalah. Such are the primary principles of the written word, shadow of that spoken Logos which created the world. Each student has the task to ascertain for himself, where the Kabbalah is concerned, what must be considered true and reliable, and to set up on his own score a reliable standard of reference. This standard can only be spiritual experience. For this reason, the tree of life has been adopted as the framework of practical magic, since it is, in the first place, open to synthetic and constructive classification and because it provides what may suitably be called a magical alphabet. It must be noted that the word alphabet is used, and it is so used in preference to the word language and the developments therefrom. The Kabbalah does not attempt to provide a complete magical language or an entire philosophy. Only by spiritual experience may the latter be acquired. But from the alphabet of ideas, numbers and symbols, and the intimations which it presents, the student may find himself enabled, with the aid of magical research, and with the aid of the inner spiritual experience, to construct a satisfactory edifice of a high philosophy which will take him through life. Previously, the tree of life was considered as a numerical symbol of the orderly progression of the universe from ideality, as a classifying medium to which to refer systematically the spiritual hierarchies, and finally as a frame of reference for ideas, symbols and signs which enter into practical magic. The Sephiroth may be thought of as cosmic forces, as emanations whose chief sphere of operation is in the macrocosm. The Sephiroth, I, I might add, are the basic concepts to be found on the tree of life. The crown, the first Sephira, represents the self-existent spirit, eternal, supreme, birthless and deathless, and sublimely persistent through the fleeting ages. It is by definition a metaphysical and spiritually sensitive point of consciousness, indivisible, supreme, the center from which flows all the energy and all the forces of man. As direct vehicles are the next two sephiroth, the powers of Chachma and Bina, wisdom and understanding, the two manifested poles of the creative instrument which it employs. Yet not only are they instruments, 
but they are in reality the highest aspects of the activity of the spiritual being whose hallowed light is infinite and eternal. In man, these two sephiroth are represented by principles which we call the will and intuition. Existing on the creative plane, representing the potencies emanating from the divine self in the archetypal world, the will and soul constitute with the self the imperishable, unchanging man. Yet so absurd are the ways of men, and so far have we drifted from essentials, that few of us consciously realize our essential godhood, that we, like Christ, like Buddha, like Krishna, are sons of God, gods in all verity. As the will is the active, energetic, creative power in man, and inasmuch as in practical magic the wand is the ceremonial instrument of creation, so is the wand the true symbol of the spiritual will, one, upright, towering to the heavens, a mighty and irresistible power of creation. The intuition being in opposition to will on the tree, is feminine and passive, representing the true spiritual vision of the soul or imagination. Like the chalice on the altar, it is ever open to receive the dictates and commands issuing from above. To it also is referred the spiritualized imagination, which with the will are the powers par excellence utilized in magic. The more one opens oneself to the divine will and the divine imagination of the inner self, the greater does one become in the manifestation of one's godhood, an oracle of the Most High, a spotless vehicle of the purest spiritual fire. Below the abyss, the next five sephiroth are named the human soul, a composite principle of reason, will, imagination, memory and emotion, centered in the sephira of harmony. It is this mind which is the evolutionary vehicle of the real self, a mechanism, so to speak, created through long eons of toil and suffering as a means of acquiring contact with the outside world so that by means of the experience thus obtained the self may come to a self-conscious realization of its own divine powers and high nature. It is in this mind that self-consciousness is centered. Although the psychological anomaly is true that this perceptual mechanism, evolved solely as an instrument, comes to usurp the power of that which gave it birth, setting itself on a pedestal as the ego, as that which has real power, insight, will, and the ability to solve the problems of life. In magic, it is this empirical ego, this lower self, which must be offered up in sacrifice to the higher self. As the concept of sacrifice implies that that which is renounced should be the best and the greatest sacrifice, so a well-developed mind, well-trained in all the processes of logic and thought, well stored with things of its own realm, is the greatest sacrifice which the student can lay upon the altar as an offering to the Most High. He that loses his life shall find it. Lest there be some misconstruction placed upon the words destruction and abnegation and sacrifice of the ego, let it be understood clearly that the principle itself is not destroyed. 
That, of course, is an impossibility in nature. But the false values of the ego, its complacency, the illusion that it possesses, that it alone is real and permanent, all else being its creations, these are offered for destruction. When the smugness and the false egoism in the mind is rooted out, it is an instrument of the soul than which few could be better. The ninth sephira is the foundation of the lower man. It is the Freudian id, and it is that lunar, vegetative, and instinctual principle which is concerned solely with living. This animal soul is at one and the same time a principle of energy and electromagnetic substance, the totality of the vital life currents as well as the invisible magnetic mold on which the gross atoms arrange themselves as the physical body. As a substantive principle, it is the astral body, the plastic double built of astral substance to serve as the basis or design of the physical body. It pertains to the instincts and impulses, acting as an automatic storehouse of sensations and impressions, just as the old term, the collective unconscious, may well be applied to the more archaic concept of the astral light. All the fundamental instincts of a man, the primal root impulses which he experiences, are of the sephira of Yesod, the foundation from which all life energy flows. All of these principles obtain in and function as a living organism in the principle of the physical body, attributed to the tenth and last sephira of the tree of life called the kingdom. It is the seat of every force and function of all the subtle planes of nature and every spiritual power of man. In all truth, and in this fundamental sense, the human body is in reality the temple of the Holy Ghost. William James, in his Gifford lectures of the early part of this century, wrote that one conclusion that was forced upon him as a result of certain experiments that he had conducted had forced upon him that it is our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, while all about it parted from it by only the flimsiest of screens, their lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. We may go through life without even suspecting their, their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus, and at a touch they are there in all their completeness. Definite types of mentality, which probably somewhere have their field of application and adaptation. Magic is the name for some archaic psychological methods which, to use James' term, apply the requisite stimulus to reveal other and deeper levels of consciousness which are ever present but remain, as a rule, totally unsuspected. Once this magical stimulus is applied and these levels are tapped, there occurs what has been labelled illumination, the flooding of the mind with light. Before I was blind, but now I see. This so-called transcendental experience to be reached by ritual and other technical procedures is the heart of this archaic, cabalistic and magical system and can hardly be guessed at save by some shrewd and penetrating modern psychologists such as Carl Jung and A. Maslow.
It is with the mind with which I wish in particular to occupy myself at some little length. Although it comprises the five sephiros, numbered four to eight inclusive, its central seat is in Tifereth, so-called, the sphere of harmony and equilibrium. One problem which concerns the magician is the fact that it inherent in the mind is a principle of self-contradiction which prevents its use, independent of any superior assistance, in the quest for truth and light. Using the reason alone, man can never come to any true realization of what he is in himself. That is, he can never understand by the mind alone that he is an eternal spiritual entity, a brilliant star shining by the light of its own essence within the bespangled body of Nuit, the queen of infinite space. Iamblichus lays the law down quite clearly in the mysteries that not by discursive reasoning or through philosophic thinking alone does one come into fellowship with the gods. It is through the awakening of the higher spiritual powers by means of the rite of magic that we have already defined that the consummation of the long ages is effected. What we call so casually the imagination in the ordinary man is according to the exponents of magic. The major faculty of the soul to assimilate the images and reflections of these other levels of, of awareness of which James speaks. The imagination is the vision of the soul whereby it perceives directly and immediately ideas and thoughts of every kind. The spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius of Loyola are really one specific form of magical procedure. There, Loyola counsels his disciples to relive in the sphere of the imagination all the events in the outward historical life of Jesus. By this method, they are to train their imaginations to see, touch, smell, and taste those invisible things and rehearse those incidents, long since accomplished and vanished, which were perceived through the senses of their incarnated Lord. Saint Ignatius desires the imagination to be exalted to its uttermost. If you are meditating on an article of faith, he would have you construct the locality clearly and with exactitude before the vision of the mind's eye, to observe it carefully and closely even to touch it, as it were. If it be hell, for example, he gives you burning rocks to handle. He makes you float in a frightful darkness as thick as pitch. He places liquid sulfur upon your tongue. Your nostrils are filled with a stench as of hell itself. And he shows you torments, causing you to hear excruciating groans. He would have you also construct the vision of Calvary, with the glorified Christ crowned with thorns on the cross, accomplishing the redemption of mankind, surveying the heavens with pained eyes while calling upon his Father in heaven. He would have you envisage the startling wonder of the resurrection and the miracles performed long ago in Palestine. All this, Saint Ignatius bid your will to create in imagination by constant exercise, and thus, in this way, apply James's stimulus to reveal these other levels of consciousness which are present at every moment of our lives. Perseverance and constant application will certainly bestow upon the student a will which is indomitable, a mind capable of prolonged concentration and above all, an imagination which is the essence of creativeness. 
One of the exercises that is analogous to those recommended by St. Ignatius is on a more prosaic level. The student is to picture to himself, for example, that he's sitting by a mighty waterfall, a Niagara, and before his inner eye, let him create an image of the river high up in its source, murmuring and rambling peacefully along. Then let him conceive of its gradual approach to the precipice, wild torrents of maddened waters, swirling hither and thither in churning cascades of white and foam, tumbling against the rocky boulders, and being irresistibly hurled forward over the edge. Let him further imagine these thousands of tons of water surging headlong over the precipice with a constant reverberating echo of thunder. Conceive then the spray being shot out in all directions, the beauty of the snowy surf refracting the sunlight into iridescent rainbows full of brilliant color and hue. And let him hear, and upon hearing marvel, the deep, thunderous voice of the terrific impact of their volume against the lower rocks and waters. The student may also construct in imagination more familiar things, the noise of a speeding train, the taste of chocolate, the smells of sweet perfumes and incenses, and the touch of burning coal. Not only must the imaginative formulation of the sense be distinct, that is to say, the taste of chocolate, or not of sweet caramels, for example, should be clearly imagined, but also the student should so train himself as to sustain or prolong the image or impression. By these efforts of the imagination, its power will germinate and grow, developing beyond conception, and with the passage of time, a new power of creativity and vision will come to him. Similarly, in the Hindu system, there is the prescription of meditation for much the same purpose on the tattvas, or the colored symbols of the elements, of which they claim five. Combinations of these five produce 30 sub-elements and elements the pictorial symbols of which make remarkably good objects for the exercise of the imagination. There is a red triangle for fire, a horizontal silver crescent for air, a blue circle for water, a yellow square for earth, and a black egg for spirit. The combination of any two symbols, such as a red triangle, surmounting a silver crescent, or a small blue circle placed in the middle of a yellow square, seem in a most singular way to stand out from the dark background of the inner vision and to stimulate all the powers of the imagination. Only a short time suffices to procure efficiency in the visualization of these symbols. In his introduction to a book entitled The Yoga Aphorisms of Patanjali, William Q. Judge made the statement that the ancient Hindu sages knew the secret of the development of the will and how to increase tenfold both its power and efficacy. This secret of the ages, the enhancement of the power of will and wisdom, has never really been lost. Will, to the student of the divine magic, is the primary factor in the production of whatever spiritual changes he proposes. The will is neither good nor bad. It is power only, and so vitalizes all things alike. In a sense, here is where a certain danger of magic intrudes. It is not enough for the student to become God-intoxicated and erect in the knowledge and conversation of his higher self. Great as this is in itself, it is not yet enough. For into him whose mind is disorderly and ignorant 
and poorly disciplined, the gods pour their wine in vain. Because the mind is abdicated to reach a higher synthesis and a nobler kind of consciousness, there is no cause to neglect the application of that faculty to the matters pertaining to its own place in nature. That is why, under the ancient systems, grammar, philosophy, science and logic were taught to cultivate and so improve the mind, and mathematics too, because the methods of that science were disciplinary and orderly. Geometry, music and the arts were also inculcated and a system of symbols was deduced therefrom. Now the consequence of all these disciplines is obvious. As time progresses through this technique, the student accomplishes two separate things, both of them being major aspects of what we have come to call the great work. A perpetual vigilance approximating a most powerful current of willpower has been generated. This from the beginning tends to bring all the activities of the human being under conscious control of the will. The second aspect of accomplishment is that not only does the student find himself in possession of a greatly enhanced will, but that the mind itself, all the faculties comprised in the ego, previously so troublesome and lacking in concentration, has gradually, because of the dynamic will and these various disciplines, has been placed under control. And in this way, the student becomes enabled to fulfill the terms of what James so eloquently wrote. We apply the necessary stimulus and there we find in all their completeness these definite types of consciousness which must play an enormous role in the future evolution of mankind.